What's going on YouTube? It's Teach coming at you with another 2024 NFL mock draft. Three rounds as always, and of course we will have trades in today's mock draft. Excited to run through all these scenarios that I have cooked up. I do want to have a quick disclaimer before we get started. No wide receiver trades in this one. You know, I've been kind of, you know, I had T. Higgins trade in my last mock. You know, Brandon Ayuk rumors are swirling right now. Decided I'm going to wait at least another week, maybe two, before I start incorporating that until I can get a real idea of you know who the top suitors are and what the value might be. I just don't want to speculate too much and throw these videos out of whack. Also, there's a ton of great prospects to talk about, so let's just make the show basically about them. So with all that down, of course, as we go through today's video, if you enjoy, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and of course, I want to know what you think about this mock. Who's your favorite team? Did you like the picks? Do you like the position groups I'm targeting for your squad? All that, I want to hear that down below in the comment section. Let's go ahead and start by kicking it off with the Chicago Bears. No surprise here. Caleb Williams is the number one overall pick. It's going to happen. So we'll go ahead and move on. Drake May, to me, should be the second quarterback off the board. Um, and that's what I have here in uh, today's video for Washington. Last time out, it was Jaden. I do think this is kind of where the draft begins. Uh, not that it's going to be a major difference in today's video because the number three pick is going to be Jaden Daniels. Um, but really, all three of these teams need a reset at quarterback. So it all makes sense. It's just going to come down to the order. Is it going to be Drake May? Is it Jaden Daniels? You know, I, I think the... The Drake may, oh, watch out, he might fall. You know, I think a lot of that was kind of nothing against Lance Zierlein, but his mock draft kind of explored that, and uh, maybe he's hearing that. I don't doubt that, but um, I also hear he crushed interviews at the Combine. I, I just see enough arm talent, plus he's on the younger side. He's 21. Uh, I think you clean up a couple of things with his footwork, and this guy's going to have a lot of people's issues with him evaporate like that. So, and honestly, that could happen this offseason with a QB coach, right? Like, we could be talking about him having his issues fixed by the time he gets to the NFL, kind of like what happened with Justin Herbert coming to Oregon. You can nitpick things, but really, you know, with one solid summer, you can kind of clean all that up, and that's what happened with Herbert. I think the same is true for Drake May. Really intrigued by Gene Daniels to New England. Uh, you know, if you believe the rumors that that's their guy, like, that's really fascinating. Uh, going back to this dual-threat quarterback, um, but, hey, he's coming off the Heisman Trophy um, and great deep ball passer. Would love to see this, you know, offense hit a new stride in New England. We, we, we've seen what it's looked like over the last decade. I think it just needs to take a new shape entirely. I think Jaden Dan Daniels is a good step in that direction. Number four here, I thought about a trade for, uh, you know, Arizona moving back. We're going to have the trade instead happen here at five. Um, I just think, yeah, Arizona could get a haul, money, Austin Ford, totally. And I could see a world where the Arizona Cardinals do what I'm about to do with the Chargers, not to spoil too much of what I'm about to do, but there's going to be some wheeling and dealing here in a second. But um, it's going to come down to the receiver board. Like, if they think neighbors, if they have neighbors over Marv, then maybe they do do what I'm going to do with the Chargers. But um, I just look at that receiver core, and they could just use a slam dunk home run, top number one wide receiver. Um, and I think that's Marvin Harrison. Uh, I, do, I, I can get behind the argument people are having right now with, you know, neighbors and Marv. I've been saying it the same kind of this whole cycle. I think any other year, Roma Dunze would never be number one wide receiver off the board. Like, any other year, neighbors is easily the number one guy off the board. And this year, I think it's a possibility. Um, and actually, I think Todd McShay put it out kind of perfectly. You know, Marvin Harrison Jr. is just like an easy, this guy's going to be a bona fide stud, Pro Bowl level guy, all pro probably. But Neighbors could bring something that could like change a game. He could, he could bring that Tyreek element to it. And, you know, w there's no wrong answer there. Do you want the bona fide stud? Or do you want to take a chance on the guy who could do all those things, but also maybe change the element of the game a little bit with his explosiveness and what he could do after the catch and uh, be that Tyreek Hill type, uh, you know, threat. So, Really intrigued by that. Uh, who ends up being that first receiver off the board? Who the Cardinals like here? And then maybe how that could dictate them shuffling around and uh, maneuvering the top 10. But instead, I have them taking the, the kind of layup selection here. Marvin Harrison Jr. I know a lot of Cardinals fans would love to see this. As we mentioned, Chargers are going to trade back here. And no surprise here, you know, it's going to be the Minnesota Vikings. You get the 23rd overall pick in the first round. It looks like you're, you know, you're loading up to make a move to get inside the top 10. Um, Trade value wise, five and sixty nine sound, or actually, honestly, it's still the Vikings giving up slightly more points than the Chargers here. Um, I, I've kind of gone back and forth on whether the Chargers should include pick sixty nine, so we'll come back to that later on in this video because I think who I have the Vikings taking at sixty nine would still be a good ad for the Chargers. So either way you spin it, I think that player should be a good pick there at pick number sixty nine, which should I say a nice pick in that spot. But anyways, Vikings give up eleven and twenty three. Chargers send back 5 and 67, and then Minnesota takes J.J. McCarthy. You know, I think that franchise guy kind of laid it out perfectly. Even if Jane Daniels were on the board here, a lot of ways, J.J. McCarthy is the better fit for this Kevin O'Connell offense. He doesn't utilize the run game as much as, you know, uh, some other play callers like a Brian Dable or, or just kind of one of the first guys that came to mind. And again, kind of referencing that franchise's guy, latest mock draft. Um, 
And even you look at Josh Dobbs, like a lot of the rushing production that came from Dobbs this year was off script, done on his own, you know, kind of volition. So I don't think adding that rushing element is something that KOC is like going out there looking for. Like, I don't think he's dying to add that. Uh, instead, he wants a guy who can just sit back, fire, go from one to two to three, be a quick level processor, attack the middle of the field, have that arm strength to fit it into tight windows, stretch the field with that arm strength too. So I think J.J. McCarthy in a lot of ways is just more of who Kevin O'Connell is looking for in a quarterback than Jane Daniels. But here in this case, Daniels off the board. So J.J. is definitely going to be the pick for Minnesota. Uh, then we get to the Giants. I'm going to go Roma Dunze. I think this is the first mock where I've had Rome be the second wide receiver off the board. If I'm wrong on that, I apologize. But I think it's a live possibility to me, neighbors. You know, I've said this before. Best receivers I've scouted since starting this in 2017. It's Marv, Jamar Chase, and then, and they're they're kind of one A one B, and then Neighbors right there at number three. So uh, I I'd go Neighbors here, but I can also see where the Giants look at it and say well, we got the deep threat guy in Hyatt. We have a bunch of guys who already play in the slot. I'd rather just have the I know this guy's going to play on the outside, and Odunze I think could play on the inside. He could kind of have this Keenan Allen esque type of role down the line. But right now I love the idea of that you know six foot three possession back shoulder specialist with also enough deep speed at 447 in the 40 time like all that uh playing on the outside and he's just that physical big body guy they don't have right now in new york so maybe that's what nudges them in the direction of odunze versus malik neighbors tennessee titans joe all this is just this is an easy pick here and you're gonna see it a ton throughout my mocks and the rest of mocks of the draft cycle um him plus peter skronsky on the left side of the offensive line would be an absolute slam dunk um let me get to the atlanta falcons i'm gonna have a trade here i'm gonna have the chargers move back into the top 10 and they're gonna take malik neighbors so um I was looking at this, and I want to make sure I got the right trade chart. Yeah, so pick 105 and a future third. And I know Falcons fans are going to be like, what? Why would we do this? Well, look, um, you move back three spots, and you're, spoiler alert, you're going to get the same player I would have given you here at eight. So all you're doing is getting the same player plus pick 105, which anytime you get a pick in and around the top 100, that's a good asset. And a future third-round pick. Like, think about what the Kansas City Chiefs just did with Legereus Sneed. Like, yeah, you wish that third-round pick could have been this year, but at the same time, Time goes on, and eventually that asset's going to become a necessary, you know, a pick for you to have. So for Atlanta, it's just like, yeah, it's going to be off in the distant. We're not thinking about it in the immediate future. But then next draft cycle, you're going to be like, oh, damn, and the Falcons have two-thirds. Solid. That could lead to them getting that extra, you know, defensive back or that extra edge rusher or that extra interior offensive, whatever that they need on that offense. So just kind of forget about the pick, store it, save it for the future. I like this actually a lot for the Falcons. And again, they're going to get the same player I would have given them at pick number eight. So it's just, it's an absolute win, in my opinion. But I'm going to give the, the Chargers Malik Neighbors. That type of deep threat, that type of explosiveness, plus Justin Herbert's arm strength is just a like match made in heaven for me. Um, I, you know, I, I and since you have pick number 23 still for the Chargers, I don't want to give away too much, you'll be able to address tackle then. So in this case, I think you'll be able to get the best of both worlds. What should the Chargers do at five, receiver or tackle? Well, in this first round mock, I got them doing both. And yeah, this team, do they have the flexibility to give up, you know, a future third? and pick 105 this year, you know, there's a lot of holes in that roster, for sure. But I could also see where you get the top-end talent with these two first-rounders. We're going to trade back uh, in the second round with their pick at 37. So you can kind of recoup some of those assets later on. I'm not really worried about pick 105 because they're ultimately going to get pick number 98 from the Pittsburgh Steelers in a future move in this video. So I'm not really worried about that. The future third, depending on how much work they can do this offseason, that could be something where it's like, mm, wish the Chargers had that third-round pick. So I admit that that kind of sucks to part ways with, but to get Malik Neighbors... Plus, you know, I think he just makes Josh Palmer look that much better as a two. Quentin Johnson, then as a yards after the catch, third guy. I think it just makes everything fall into place. All right, let's get on to the Chicago Bears. Same pick as last time out. Byron Murphy, the second. All of last draft cycle, we talked about how, dude, Jalen Carter is a perfect fit for Matt Eberflus is that three-tech pass rusher. I think the same is true here for Byron Murphy, the second. If Gervon Dexter can pick up where he left off last season, him plus Byron Murphy, the second, I think is an awesome one-two punch in the middle of that defense. And again, He's just the three tech that Matty Rufloos is looking for in that D line. Jets, Brock Bowers, easy pick here. A little light for the tight end, but uh, I think in a zone blocking scheme, he's more than fine uh, holding his loan, uh, holding his workload there as a blocker. But also, he's just like immediately, you know, I know Mike Williams is there, but honestly, like he might be the second best, you know, pass catcher on that team. Uh, and especially when you take into account Mike Williams' injury history. I think this makes a ton of sense. He's at, at worst the third best pass catcher on that roster, which if Brock Bowers is your third best pass catcher on your roster and your quarterback's Aaron Rodgers at this point in his career, that's a good thing. That's where you want to be positioning yourself. So I love this pick a ton. He can play some slot. He can play some tight end. You can even get, you know, kind of kind of get wild with it and play him out wide. I think he could do that too. So 
just get creative. Like I would just call on Aaron Rodgers and Nathaniel Hackett to use this guy in as many different ways as possible. Atlanta Falcons, as noted, it's going to be the same pick. I would have given him an eight. I'll go with Dallas Turner. Um, in a lot of ways, like I'm kind of toying around with the idea of Leatu Latu again. Shout out to the franchise guy. He's making a compelling case for this team to, hey, they're in a win now window. Why not go get the most win now edge that there is? Um, but I also think the explosiveness, the upside that Dallas Turner brings, plugging him into that Raheem Morris defense makes a ton of sense. Um, and right now, and again, kind of the argument could be made for Latu. This team's missing a guy with 10 plus sacks a year type of production. Latu might be able to do that right away. I think Turner might be able to do it right away, too. Like, I don't think he's that far off from being a pretty win-now type of guy, uh, but with room to grow in the future. So it just comes down to, you, do you want to see everything you're going to get out of a player right away, or do you want some pretty good returns on investment? And then, you know, over the course of year two, year three, year four of this rookie contract, Dallas Turner really starts to hit his stride. Because I think that's ultimately going to be the projection for Dallas Turner. I think he'll be a good player year one, but then he'll get special by, you know, year three, year four. Let's get on to the Denver Broncos. No bow next year. So Denver fans, you can rejoice. I'm giving you a little bit of a break. Instead, let's give you Tyrion Arnold. To me, should still be the first corner off the board. Love the movement skills. Love the man coverage skills. I'm not worried about a 4-5-40. Kind of the same thing with Pat Sertan. You know, it's like the 40 time wasn't sexy, but did you see the guy on tape? Like, it's okay. It, it plays. It's more than enough. Um, Sertan does have a lot more size than Arnold, and I totally hear that. Um, I was like the inside out flex. They got Jaquan McMillan playing the slot. He was a awesome playmaker and I think a big part of the reason the team had a random five game win streak in the middle of the season he was just creating turnovers left and right so my idea is here Arnold plays on the outside I like him a ton as a slot player maybe you get there down the line but I think that number two corner spot major need for uh, Denver and we are going to give him a quarterback later on in this mock to the Las Vegas Raiders Taliese Fawanga I mean this is just you know this is a clear one upgrade over Jermaine Luminar who's turned his career around but how awesome is it to say that, yeah, Luminor's turned his career around, but Fuag is an upgrade over that. That's fantastic. Um, it just kind of fits this team's identity. Mauler, mean, you know, uh, and I also think from a pass game standpoint, he's fine. Like, I, I don't have any major concerns there. So with the loss of Luminor, right tackle sticking out as a major need. Maybe Thayer Mumford gets a shot, but I, I think they're going to turn it over to uh, Fuanga here. And if he's there at 13, I think that's going to be a guy they're keying in on. Especially after they signed Christian Wilkins, I kind of thought Byron Murphy the second if he's here, Fuanga if he's here, those could be guys they look at. But with the uh, signing Wilkins, I definitely like Fuanga. We're going to go back to offensive line later on for the Raiders. Maybe Mumford has a shot to start a guard. That's kind of my, my one caveat when we go into your offensive line later for the Raiders. To the New Orleans Saints, let's go Olu Fashanu, or Fashnu, excuse me, I've, I've heard that that's the uh, proper pronunciation now, so Olu Fashnu, I think it's a great landing spot for him, I also think it's ultimately the best thing that could happen to Trevor Penning, um, just kind of raw as a pass protector, but dude absolutely has a mean streak, really nice mover too, uh, you can utilize his power as your new Andres Pete in a lot of ways on the interior offensive line, uh, so shift Penning inside, Olu Fashnu as your left tackle, I am concerned about the hand size, but you know what? Considering the amount of duress and pressure that was put on Derek Carr last year, just getting what we saw out of Olu Fashnu last year as a pass protector from Penn State over the last two years, really, and plugging him in at left tackle, that makes Derek Carr's situation a whole lot better. Hopefully, Ryan Ramchek stays healthy, can play the full year, because he got a really nice pass protecting uh, duo there at tackle. And then ultimately, like I said, I think this is the best move that could happen for Trevor Penning. Indianapolis Colts, uh, we're going to go receiver in the second round. So I'm going to go Quinion Mitchell here in the first. Really excited to talk about that receiver pick at 46, if memory serves. Yep, pick 46. Uh, but Quinion Mitchell, ton of experience playing zone. Also shows he has the goods to play some man, not only man, but press man. Love the athleticism. That checks a lot of Chris Ballard's boxes. Um, Ballard does tend to lean towards, you know, power five schools and SEC. He's drafted a lot of those guys. Also, the SEC is just a premier conference, so that skews those numbers a little bit. But I don't think he's, he'd be worried by drafting a guy from Toledo, especially after what he showcased at the Senior Bowl. Him plus Juju Brents and Kenny Moore. All of a sudden, that corner room looks like an absolute strength for the Indianapolis Colts. And when you're in a division with you know, C.J. Stroud and Trevor Lawrence, it's probably a good thing. Uh, let me get to the Seattle Seahawks. Love the fit of Jax Powers Johnson. He could be a starter over Ulu Uluwatimi. If he doesn't work out, doesn't look good in training camp, or you just play him at left guard and Uluwatimi gets a chance to start at center. Anthony Bradford then at right guard. I love the idea of that interior offensive line. I think Bradford, like, he's not great, but, like, he's a solid run blocker. Um, and then hopefully with some growth in the pass protection game, like, he can get better. He can be a solid starter. I believe in Ulu Uluwatimi. Um, and then Jax Powers Johnson figuring in there makes that, like, go from a really rough interior offensive line to, like, yeah, it's not bad. It's not a it's not a major uh, weakness. They have actually a stud in the middle there with JPJ. Uh, I could also see a world where they're double dipping in this position. JPJ plays center, and then maybe they draft another guard later down the line. I could also see that as a uh, possibility here for Seattle. Ultimately, they know what the, their thoughts on Uluwa Timmy are. I don't. I liked him as a prospect, but we'll see in the NFL draft like what Seattle thinks about Uluwa Timmy. 
then we get to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, they lose a field stretcher. Let's give them another one. And Brian Thomas Jr. I mean, they don't make him, you know, six foot four running a forty like him, you know. Uh, and also, like I think it was Dane Brugler who tweeted out, but the fastest uh, time of the last twenty yards of the forty, right? So from like yard twenty one through forty, Brian Thomas Jr. ran that the fastest. So this is a guy who like not only does the first step quicks there, I think, but like when he hits top end speed with those long strides. There's not many people who keep up with that. So, uh, yeah, you lose a field stretcher in Ridley. Now you get a new one with even more size. And I like the ball tracking. I know Brian Thomas Jr. has some drops. Um, and the catch rate can be a little bit, or drop rate, excuse me, could be a bit of a concern with his draft profile. I think he'll clean that up at the NFL level. I believe that, I I, can, I just believe that's a correctable flaw in people's games. Um you know, time will tell though. But um, I think getting open is the harder skill, and speed is not something that can be taught. And especially that frame. Uh, and, and considering this is a Jags offense, that you know, like we're not asking him to do what Christian Kirk does in this offense, right? Like we're not asking him to do what Evan Ingram does in this offense. You know, like he has a specified specified role in this offense, and I think his skill set perfectly matches up with what they're looking for in that role. We're not asking him to do everything. We're not asking him to be Marvin Harrison Jr. So I really like that fit in Jacksonville. Let's get to the Cincinnati Bengals at pick number 18. I'm going to go Troy Fatanu. Um, yes, this would require a flip over the right side, but didn't slow down. Well, I guess it did slow down Panay Sewell for like seven, eight weeks. And then by the back half of his rookie year, he started to figure it out. And by year two, he was a damn good right tackle. And, you know, if you're the Bengals, you're not really looking to wait. But I also think there's so much NFL readiness when Troy Fatanu. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a world where they don't rush him out there if he's not ready to start. I, I think he'll make the transition just fine. He's just a, such a fluid mover. You can just tell, like, it just comes naturally to him. Uh, so I think the flip over to right tackle is more than feasible. And like that type of movement skills actually serves as a really nice compliment to Orlando Brown Jr., who has a ton of strength and can move okay, but I think five times got a beat in that department. So get you the bookend tackles and also just an absolute upgrade from a pass protection standpoint. And when your quarterback's Joe Burrow coming off an injury, the pass pro is the number one thing you're worried about. Let's get to the Rams here at 19. Same pick as last time out. Jared Verse, I mean, just an absolute home run fit, I think. Him plus Byron Young, I actually think, complement each other really well. You're not going to replace Aaron Donald, but I think Kobe Turner is a really solid pass rusher. Um, and, again, you're not going to replace Aaron Donald, but he could still bring that type of top-end pass rush juice from the interior, which makes the life uh, of Jared Verse that much easier, and which makes Byron Young's job that much simpler as well. Uh, Verse may not be the super bendy guy, but... He's got it everywhere else. I think the moves are there. I think the power is there. The straight line explosiveness, the first step get off. He's got everything but like elite bend, which I'm willing to take that here at 19. Pittsburgh Steelers here at 20, doing something a little different. Um, I think there's a more than 0% chance the Steelers are content going back uh, into the season with Dan Moore at left tackle and Bradford Jones at right tackle. And that's ultimately kind of the mindset I adopted for this uh, mock draft for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So slot's a major issue. I think Cooper DeGene like would absolutely fill that void. Uh, love what he could do as a run defender, which, you know, Pittsburgh last year, specifically in the playoff game, the Bills were basically deciding if they're going to run the ball, whether Cam Hayward's on the field or not. And when it's that easy, you probably need some run game, you know, reinforcements. Uh, you know, I think Keanu Benton with a bigger, you know, role can help out there as well. So, uh, and I think Cooper Jean just makes it that much easier. He could kind of be a bigger uh, Mike Hilton in a lot of ways for this team, help in the run game, be used as a blitzer, but also an absolute coverage upgrade from what this team has had uh, over the last few years since Mike Hilton left. So, uh, and plus, you get Dante Jackson, him plus JPJ. You have one speed guy, one physical guy on the outside. Cooper Jean then to play, play the slot. Really like how that brings that uh, cornerback room together in Pittsburgh. We're going to go uh, center in the second round. So no tackle in today's video for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, as much as that pains me to say as a Steelers fan. But I think there's I think there's a world where Mike Tomlin and, and crew are comfortable with Dan Moore and Broderick Jones playing out of position for whatever reason. Uh, Miami Dolphins, everyone say it with me. Graham Barton. I mean, the Swiss Army knife for a team that we saw when offensive line injury started to pile up. This team's efficiency kind of went down, especially on the offensive side of the ball. So, um, yeah, I think day one upgrade over Liam Eikenberg at left guard. Um, and then the flexibility to play center, depending on this Connor Williams injury. If Tyron Armstead misses time, he could be a fill-in guy at the tackle. And we're going to go back to the interior offensive line in the second round. I just think offensive line heavy with these first two picks for Miami is the way to go. I also love the idea of JT Sanders, trust me. But, like, I think you got to eat your vegetables with these first two picks for Miami. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles here at 22. I'm going to go with Marius Mims. Ton of upside. And honestly, like, a more polished product than what you would assume for a guy with like eight career college starts. Uh, it's just going to come down to his health, which, you know, Lane Johnson's had a lot of that too. So like, do the Eagles want to do that again? Could they go with Tyler Guyton? Who's pretty raw. I totally think that makes sense. Guyton, I think is Lane Johnson's pick. So you could totally go in that direction. I'd be fine with it. 
but Mims is just like such a special like size speed but also like He's not as raw as you may think. Um, I think Broderick Jones was a better mover last year, but I also think Mims is a further developed product than Broderick Jones, so give and take there. Uh, but man, I would just love to see him plugged in. And also, I think the fact that he is like a little bit more like polished than someone like a Tyler Guyton could be good in the event that Lane Johnson misses time. Like You're not as worried about Mims stepping in in that case, other than the fact that, okay, maybe he gets hurt too. Then you are with Guyton, where it's like, okay, we, we really wanted a year or two to develop this guy. Now he's having to play in a week nine game against the Cowboys, you know, whatever. So I, I, in a lot of ways, I think Mims could be the the better fit here at 22 over Lane Johnson, you know, getting his guy from Oklahoma and Tyler Guyton. But I'd be totally fine with Guyton. I've done that a ton in these mock drafts. I'm fine with Mims, Latham, Guyton. I, I like them all for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, then we get to the Chargers. And speaking of J.C. Latham, I actually think he's a he can make a lot of sense uh, for Jim Harbaugh and playing that right tackle spot could even play him at guard if you really believe in Trey Pipkins, but I doubt that that's the case. I've never been a big Trey Pipkins guy, so I think Latham's your immediate replacement for that. Like the movement skills, you know, 345 is what he checked in at his pro day. The movement skills look really good. The testing numbers are really solid. I think, you know, last year at Alabama, got up to 360. That kind of made him a little more sluggish. Um, and uh, I think getting back down to 340, 345 was the perfect move for him. Uh, he still has plenty of strength. Like, I, I don't think he, that's become a weakness now that he's dropped 20 pounds either. Um, and it kind of would be ironic that, you know, you know, Alabama, Michigan, Latham gets blown up and that leads to Jalen Milrow being tackled for a loss. Michigan goes to the national championship game. Kind of ironic if Jim Harbaugh drafted that guy that cost Alabama, maybe if you want to say it that way, um, that uh, national semifinal. Just irony. Uh, let me get on to the Dallas Cowboys. I also love the idea of Tyler Guyton here. Trust me. I, I And I would love to have a mock draft where Grant Barton falls here. Jackson Powers Johnson falls here. I like those players a ton. Um, it's just hard to have other teams not select those guys. But I promise Dallas fans, I will make it happen. Today, you know, I'm going to go Adonai Mitchell. I've done this before. But I, like I said it before, Michael Gallup was cut. Like, if you're going to move on from Michael Gallup, if you want to go get a jump ball, pluck it out of the air type, and I Mitchell's the dude to replace Michael Gallup. And also, like, Brandon Cooks, by early as next offseason, probably going to be leaving the payroll. Like, it could be next offseason. Maybe it's one more. But, you know, like, money's become a uh, an issue for the Brandon Cooks, like, keeping him on roster. Like, eventually that's going to become a move where they just have to move on from him. And Adnai Mitchell has the deep speed to kind of replace that. So it serves kind of two and one. He's a Michael Gallup immediate replacement, but also I think long term could become a deep threat replacement for Brandon Cooks. Uh, love to see the more consistent route running, but also Jerry likes drafting these Texas guys and plugging them into his roster. So, um, and like we saw CD Lamb, uh, I, he was a sharp route runner in Oklahoma. So I think that's a great mentor for Adnai Mitchell to kind of have and be like, hey, I got to run 100% of every single route. I know what you're, I know where you're coming from when you said that. You know, you didn't run every route at 100% at Texas because you were playing every snap you can't have that at the NFL level and we'll limit the snaps if we have to and I, I actually see a lot of the movement skills and you know Brett Coleman said the same thing Sam Monton from PFF has said the same thing he's kind of got George Pickens skill specifically plucking out of the air but with CD Lamb movement now when you say that it's like holy shit you just described a future Hall of Famer and you know maybe Adonai Mitchell does become that but it is kind of interesting how to how like in the air, he looks like one guy. With the ball in his hands, he looks like a completely different dude. So even just from the movement standpoint, the fact that he does look look like CeeDee Lamb, that could be a reason why Dallas is like, yeah, that's our guy. So just kind of an interesting thought. And I think that's a live possibility that they go receiver at 24. Uh, let me get to the Green Bay Packers. We're going to have a couple of edge rushers come off the board here. Leati Latu, I was looking at the Preston Smith contract, was just reviewing it. I think this was the same pick that Daniel Jeremiah had in his mock. Um, if not, it was Mel Kuyper Jr., which, believe it or not, I did record a reaction and continuation of that. But no audio. The audio didn't come through, and I didn't have the time to re-record it. So apologies you didn't get to see that. But I think it was Daniel Jeremiah's mock with Leati Latu going to Green Bay. Looked at the Preston Smith. Smith contract, and in a lot of ways, it makes a lot of sense to cut Preston Smith next offseason. You'll still have some dead money, but you'll save about $9 million, $8 million, which I could see where that's like, okay, we could use that and get a spot starter at this place, you know. I can see where the Green Bay Packers are looking to do that. They're also a team that wants to win, right? Like, the NFC North is gearing up. The Vikings just made a, a move into the top five to get a quarterback, and, you know, the, the Lions are looking to go back-to-back -back in the division. Like, if Green Bay wants to keep up, like, a win-down move makes a lot of sense. They like to go defense in round one. Leotu Latu does come with some injury concerns, but everything else tells me that he kind of fits the Green Bay MO. Um, so I can totally see where they're drafting him right now, and it allows them to move on for Preston Smith next offseason. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I'm going to go Chop Robinson. Does kind of, it, it's it's giving Joe Tryon Shainka for sure, where it's like uber athletic, little raw of a pass rusher, but another stab in the dark at that type of prospect. They are a little boom bust for sure. I think Tryon Shainka is coming along slowly but surely, but I think Chop Robinson 
maybe it's a little bit of a quicker curve just because from an athletic standpoint, this guy, like Tryon Shank is a good athlete, but Chop Robinson is another level. So even just winning with speed and bend year one, I think you can get some good production out of him. It's just going to come down to the coaching staff. Like year two, year three, you want to see this guy have a move set. And if he does, this guy can become a really, really special uh, player and he can become an absolute steal here at 26. Arizona Cardinals at 27. This is another one that, you know, it's just, it's the perfect value for Johnny Newton, and it's the perfect team that needs this type of guy. And, and really, the Cardinals' interior defensive line is an absolute mess. So plugging in a high-floor guy like Johnny Newton makes all the sense in the world. He improves their run defense. He improves their pass rush. Love this fit. Going to continue to mock it in a lot of future mock drafts. Buffalo Bills here at pick number 28. I'm going to go Keon Coleman. They're looking to replace Gabe Davis. Not worried about the 40 time. I'm more concerned about the gauntlet. Uh, and I think Keon Coleman showcases enough wiggle to where he'll become a better route runner with some time. But even if he's just running the Gabe Davis route tree, I actually like Keon Coleman doing that better. You know, that basketball background, I, I feel like I can just trust him to go up in the air and win it. Uh, like the ball skills, like the hands. Um, and I feel like the hate for Keon Coleman's gone a little too far. I think back half the first round is a good place for him to go. Um, and especially, you know, like Josh Allen's my favorite player in the league. Trust me, like I, I say this not, I, I don't really want to say this, but I have to admit it. There are not many quarterbacks in the league that throw fucking balls like Josh Allen does. Like, he does it a lot. And, like, this is the perfect guy to be like, you know what? Screw it. Someone's down there. Keon Coleman with his ball skills, his vertical, his size, his strength. That's a perfect guy to just, like, give a chance to. So, like that a ton. I also think yards after the catch-wise, Keon Coleman just could be a tank. And uh, they didn't really use Gabe Davis in that regard. So, I think you could get more yak production out of Coleman than they ever did out of Gabe Davis. So... Let's move on to the Detroit Lions then at 29. We go Nate Wiggins here. Cam Sutton, former Steeler, uh, decided to just light his career on fire. Bold choice, Cotton. We'll see how that pays off. Uh, but corner was already a need because Cam Sutton wasn't very good last year. Mosley's on a one-year deal. It's kind of Carlton Davis and then Brian Branch in the slot and then some options to be that number two corner. Let's just draft one. Nate Wiggins plus Carlton Davis. I like that a ton. Uh, I'm a big Carlton Davis guy. Even though last year was tough, I think he can bounce back. Nate Wiggins, love the coverage flexibility. Man zone, we're seeing Aaron Glenn incorporate more zone coverage. Also the 40 time. Let's just say instead of 4-2-8, it's more 4-3-3. Now that he's back up to 182, that to me is ideal. I think, that, I think that's perfect. It's a great compliment to Carlton Davis. Love the flexibility and coverage. And uh, number two corner, major need for Detroit. And they get to go to the cornerback spot here at 29 before it kind of drops off. And you don't really want to be drafting a guy at 61, in my opinion. Just my opinion. Let's get on to the Baltimore Ravens then here at 30. This round of Tyler Guyton come off the board. A little raw for sure, but I like the upside. And I like what he showed at the Senior Bowl. And the Ravens have a great track record of developing, uh, drafting and developing these guys to hit their best potential. I'd love to see if they could do the same thing here with Tyler Guyton as a Morgan Moses replacement. Uh, I also love the idea of Ladd McConkey here. Just had to take a break. And you know what's crazy? <clears throat> These last few mocks, I've been mocking Lad McConkey to the Ravens, and I haven't even talked about the Todd Munkin uh, overlap when he was at Georgia and Lad McConkey was a Georgia Bulldog, too. I, trust me, I like the fit that much that I wasn't even thinking about his former OC now being the OC in Baltimore. That's just how much I like the fit. So you could go there, but I also really like Tyler Guyton as that Morgan Moses replacement. 49ers here at pick number 30, 31. Um, I'm just going to make this left side of the offensive line absolute, uh, an absolute force to be reckoned with. Jordan Morgan playing left guard next to Trent Williams. Good luck uh, to Seattle, the Rams, uh, Arizona Cardinals. I do not want to face that offensive line twice a year. Uh, and man, Christian McCaffrey, like that guy needed any extra help making his job easier. Well, it just did. Elijah Mitchell, too, is that number two back. His speed right behind that left side of the offensive line. I would love to see it. Also, I think Morgan makes a ton of sense in three, four years' time where Trent Williams hangs it up. You could just shift Jordan Morgan over to play left tackle. I think it makes a lot of sense. And if he's there at 31, I feel like this is a tough pick for the 49ers to pass up. In a perfect world, like Chop Robinson or Jordan Morgan, I think would be a great addition to San Francisco. Uh, then we get to pick 32. Uh, and speaking of Lad McConkey, this is where Mr. McConkey is going to come off the board. I'd love to see this team get some more size. Like Adonai Mitchell would be an ideal case, right? Because you get the long speed, you get the contested catch ability, you get the jump ball skills, and you get some size that you don't currently have. But I'm willing to part ways with that just because this team needs people to get open. Patrick Mahomes will make it happen if you're open. And Lad McConkey, natural separator, just so quick, but also an abundance of speed to be a deep threat. It's not like you're just getting a shifty slot wide receiver who works underneath. This guy can stretch the field. He could be a Tyler Lockett with plus intermediate route running. Um, so love that fit. Him plus Rasheed Rice plus, you know, Hollywood Brown. A lot of guys who could do a lot of different things after the catch, intermediate and deep, deep down the field. If this were to be the pick, it feels like, again, lacking a little size for sure. But 
It feels like as well-rounded a receiver core as we've seen Patrick Mahomes have, specifically since Tyreek Hill left. But even when Tyreek was there, like Tyreek, Sammy Watkins, they could do a lot of different things. But they get Ladd, plus, again, Hollywood Brown and Rasheed Rice. Now they got three guys who all three can kind of do a, a lot of different things. Maybe Rasheed Rice isn't as deep, uh, as much of a deep threat as the other two. But I digress. I think I made my point. Love that fit. It gives you really three solid receivers plus Travis Kelsey. All right, speaking of solid wide receivers, we're going to have two go off the board back-to-back here. Xavier Leggett. Big physical wide receiver really does remind me of AJ Brown. So um, just a guy that the Panthers don't have currently in their wide receiver room. You know, Deontay Johnson's not the most physical guy, so I like Leggett as a nice compliment there to Deontay Johnson. Uh, then we get to New England Patriots. Let's go uh, Troy Franklin here. I'm admittedly not a huge Troy Franklin guy, but I also think his yards after this, the catch skill set with Jaden Daniels and Pop Douglas there really creates a really fascinating like I don't want to have to tackle Jaden Daniels I don't want to have to tackle Pop Douglas I don't want to have to tackle Troy Franklin like that creates a lot of interesting problems for defense I also like the field stretching ability um I, I was never really a fan of the Tyquan Thornton pick. That was one of the weirder... Like, a lot of people gave some hate to the Cole Strange pick, but to me, Cole Strange at 29 made more sense than Tyquan Thornton at... Was it 40? They drafted him at 40? Whatever it was. In the second round, it just it didn't make sense to me. Um, so, I think Franklin could just be an actual receiver version of Tyquan Thornton, too, with his long speed. So, you get the yard, the yak skill set. You get the deep threat. Really like that for New England. Pick 35. I mean, Cardinals fans at this point, they know what they're getting into. You're going to get a receiver. You're going to get Johnny Newton. And you're going to get, you know, a solid corner. Uh, and, and, you know, I think last mock it was Tyrion Arnold at 27 and then Johnny Newton here. So, I'm giving you a corner plus Johnny Newton and Marv, and you're welcome for it. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry, after he ran, what, 4 4 7 at the 40? And that's with... Uh, that fracture, I don't remember the exact name of the fracture, but a, an actual fracture when he ran 447. Speed was a concern for Cooley McKinstry. Yes, that was a pro day, but the fact that he was injured kind of negates the pro day bump that you get. But even if you want to say there's a pro day bump, his size, his technique, even at 4.5 speed, I was content. The concerns were going to come out if it's like 4.58 to the 4.6 range, kind of that Kamari Laster spot, who is going to be a bit of a follower in today's mock draft, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I think with the 40 he ran plus the injury. Yeah, this guy's solidified. He's going to go somewhere in the top 40. Definitely in the top 50, but probably top 40. And honestly, probably should have gone in the first round. But he leaves on the board just long enough to give Arizona a clear-cut number one corner of the future. Uh, then we get to the Washington Commanders here at 36. Um, I'm going to go with Kingsley Suomataia. Like this team needs a left tackle of the future. Um, I don't love the offensive line coach that they brought in. I'll admit that. That's a little bit of a concern for me. He's been with the Giants the last couple of years. So, you know, the guy who couldn't coach up and develop Evan Neal, not getting this kind of toolsy project tackle in Kingsley Suomataia, don't love that. But I think Suomataia is, it's, it's almost kind of like the Drake May stuff where it's like, it's really just a couple of small tweaks to me that gets this guy to being a really good NFL starter. So let's just say this guy can do just a little bit with Suomataia to clean up how high he plays really. I think if he stops playing so tall, it'll fall into place for Sua Mataia. Love the movement skills. Love the size. Really nice footwork and pass protection skill sets on display during his time at BYU. Love that upgrade over Charles uh, Leno. Then we get to the uh, Chargers here at 37. As mentioned earlier, we are going to have them trade to kind of recoup some of the value. They lost pick 105 and then move up earlier to get Malik Neighbors. Now they're going to get pick uh, uh, 51, excuse me, and 98 for pick 37. We'll go ahead and offer the trade. It should be accepted. Yep. And then the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to draft Zach Frazier. Again, I think there's a more than 0% chance that the Steelers do not draft a tackle, unfortunately, but they absolutely should draft a center. Uh, I think Nate Herbig could be fine at center, or James Daniels. He's played center before. Maybe he plays at center and Herbig plays guard. I'd just rather see Zach Frazier. I also think there's a shot where Frazier goes round one. I'm exploring some ideas where the Steelers move back to 32, where the uh, uh, Dallas Cowboys move back to 32, and Frazier could be the pick there at 32. I really do think he could sneak into the first round. He's that good of a player. He's that tough. Um, and as long as he recovers from the injury uh, that he had in the last game at WVU, he definitely should go somewhere in the top 40. Clear upgrade of a position to need for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I cost you pick 98, but you know you moved up 22 spots from the Kenny Pickett trade. Kind of feels like you're looking to either get a center with that pick or use that pick to move up and get a center uh, So or, or another asset. I'm just saying center here. It looks like you're using that pick for a specific reason. Here I used it to move up to 37. Tennessee Titans then at 38. Originally, this was going to be TJ Tampa. Had to make some last-second shifts uh, yesterday because of the Legereus Sneed trade. Like that a ton for Tennessee. 19 million. I don't think it's a bad value uh, for Legereus Sneed either. So, like a lot of that, uh, what that move means for the Tennessee Titans. I also think it's it's a move that the the Chiefs 
I think the Chiefs and the Titans had agreed to this trade for a while now. It was just the contract negotiations from the Sneed camp and the Titans. So I, I think ultimately everyone got what they wanted out of that deal. Sneed, the Titans, and the Chiefs. But anyways, Tennessee, they lost to Nico Autry this offseason. He goes to Houston. This really underrated edge player, one of the more underrated players in football generally, but also with the capability of folding inside. I think Darius Robinson makes a lot of sense as a replacement for that type of skill set. Uh, may not be quite as NFL ready as a Danico Autry, but you know, I think with some time, he could basically be that type of player. Also, Rand Carthen coming from San Francisco. There when they drafted Eric Armstead, this inside out flexible defensive lineman. You can also see where Darius Robinson gives him some shades of that. All right, Carolina Panthers then at 39. Back on the clock, we're going to go Chris Braswell. I think this team, especially after the uh, Brian Burns trade, definitely needs to find an upgraded edge. I like the upside that Braswell brings. Only a one-year starter at Alabama, but you see the first step explosiveness, speed to power, but also a little bit of bend in there. May take some time, but... I think there's a solid upside to be tapped into for Chris Braswell. Speaking of TJ Tampa, the way I shifted things around, TJ Tampa becomes pick number 40 here. Look, Manuel Forbes was not good last year. I'm not giving up, but I didn't like him as a prospect either. So I'm not really factoring him in on this decision. But even if you think that there's upside there, Benjamin St. Juice at this point, I think we know is just not a good enough corner to be starting. And then Quan Martin plays a slot, and I think he'll be a good slot. This team needs another outside corner. Um, and TJ Tampa has all the body, you know, boxes you want to check, the skill sets, the athletic testing, all that says, like, this guy should be a man press corner. He just didn't play a whole lot of it, played more zone at Iowa State. But I kind of dig that. I like guys like that in a lot of ways. I kind of had a soft spot for Riley Moss for the same thing last year, where it's like, yeah, like, comfortable in zone, but everything says you should be playing man. That tells me you could do a little bit of both with some proper coaching. So uh, Dan Quinn runs a, runs a lot of man coverage. His background before that's in zone. I think Washington will be a blend of both. I think he really does cater a defense to who he has on the roster, if I'm honest. But I think you get a blend of both with his current crop in Washington. I think TJ Tampa makes it that much easier. And he's absolutely an upgrade at this point over Benjamin St. Juice. And then we'll see what happens with Emmanuel Forbes. Green Bay on the clock at 41. I'm going to go Karan Omegaji, a offensive tackle slash uh, former left guard at Yale. And that's kind of my plan here. I'm going to play him at left guard. Um, and then we'll flip Elton Jenkins over to play right guard. And then if Rasheed Walker doesn't work out, like to me, Zach Tom, and Rasheed Walker played well enough down the stretch last year. I've always liked Zach Tom, so really he's not a part of the equation. Rasheed Walker made enough strides down the stretch last year to where I was like, you know what, this guy could be their starting tackle. They don't need to force uh, an offensive tackle pick. They could, but they don't need to force it. Um, but let's just say he backslides a little bit. I could see a world where Omega G then moves over to left tackle. Tom becomes your right tackle. Elton Jenkins in back at left guard. And then Sean Ryan, I guess, plays right guard, which I didn't mind Sean Ryan coming out of UCLA. I actually kind of dug him. Uh, may not be a great fit for this zone blocking scheme. To me, he was more of a, a gap power guy. But nonetheless, that could be an interesting fit. All I have to say, I think Omega G kind of gives you, no matter what happens in training camp, Walker's good, cool. Omega G's going to be on an upgrade at left guard. Elton Jenkins flips over. Okay, Walker's not taking more steps forward, or actually, you know, uh, we kept him clean last year, or whatever. He's not ready to start. Cool. Omega G is going to be your starter then at left tackle. So it just gives you flexibility no matter what happens down the line for Green Bay. Uh, the Houston Texans. I'm going to go Braden Fisk here. They actually, uh, they've done enough moves at interior defensive line and they brought in a couple of run stoppers um, that I really like the idea. And I think they have the, uh, you know, infrastructure, if you will, uh, with who they have on that defensive line to just draft Braden Fisk to be a pass rush, you know, single gap uh, penetrator. I uh, don't need him to be a high level run defender. I'm not sure he will be, but super explosive they just had the florida state pro day and like watching him go through those drills just the movement st skills that he has is insane for someone as big as he is and also a small school transfer um western kentucky to florida state i'm very partial to guys who go from small school to big school and handle that jump cleanly that to me signals that they can go from college to nfl and handle that jump so i like Braden fisk he's gonna be kind of just pass rush dpr maybe only too like i could see where like first second downs he's not seeing the field so much but Get one more pass rush from the mix with Daniil Hunter, with Danico Autry, with Will Anderson. Yes, please. Please give me all that for this Houston D line. Atlanta Falcons in at pick 43. I'm going to go Kyron Jackson. Um, a guy that's kind of grown on me, man. Like, I think he has a, a, a particular set of skills, you know, not to, to be totally uh, Liam Neeson here, but Kyrie Jackson, man press type of uh, body build and frame, and even like the broad jump that like 94th percentile, like you see the explosiveness in the back pedal. And I think he's really comfortable playing man press, but I also think the, 
He's got he's got enough athlete in him to where he could play some kind of quarter zone. And I'm thinking about Raheem Morris and him kind of incorporating Brandon Staley's defense. It's a lot of quarters. I think he could do that. But then kind of Morris kind of made it his own. A little bit more man. Shades of cover three. Some Tampa two in there too. So like he's just kind of mixing it up. And ultimately, I kind of like Kyrie Jackson for all of it. He's big enough to be a kind of a nice cover two, sit in the flat corner. We talked about the man skills. I think you know cover four is just kind of man coverage but off and then cover three like this dude with his size and athleticism you telling me he can't just play an alleyway he can't just play a lane i don't know man i'm i'm, I'm kind of really buying into Kyrie jackson uh big tall corners that are athletic or are, are a weak spot for me for sure so i think the more i watch Kyrie jackson the more i like and i really like the idea of him going to that raheem morris defense so dallas turner Kyrie jackson two awesome athletes for raheem morris's defense love that a ton for the falcons uh las vegas raiders this is gonna be bonix um he just kind of stays on the board and waits and falls into their lap. Personally, I think we're going to get four quarterbacks in the top six, and then Bo Nix probably goes 12 to Denver if I'm if I'm just giving my opinion. And then Michael Penix is this kind of, he's the wild card. He could be the sixth quarterback off the board in the first round. I think right now maybe he makes it to the second, um, and that'd be my pick. But I also think there's a more than 0% chance that Bo Nix and Michael Penix make it to the second round. It's maybe the NFL could see them as just system guys, and they see the other four as going above and beyond that. They could be the offense versus like, we need Bo Nix and Michael Penix to fit in an offense, if that makes sense. Uh, so kind of want to explore that here. And hey, I mean, it's not the sexiest uh, of names to have in a QB room with a O'Connell fifth round pick. You know, you're probably not giving him the chance. It'd be Gardner Minshew versus Bo Nix. But I can see a world where, you know, hey, like we're going to win with defense. We're going to run the ball under Antonio Pierce, Bo Nix, Gardner Minshew. Those guys are good enough in Vegas. I can see a world where that's what they're looking for. Uh, then we get to the uh, New Orleans Saints at 45. I'm going to go with uh, Tyler Newbin. I think they could just use an upgraded over the top playmaking free safety. Dennis Allen's also run a decent bit of, uh, you know, single high man. He's run some cover three. He's also run plenty of just, you know, t- two under man too like he mixes it up a good bit too but uh, I think this team right now is missing that over the top free safety and Tyron Matthew could definitely do that but I also think the honey badger is just best suited when he's playing at the line of scrimmage honestly no disrespect to Alante Taylor but like if you just want to play Tyron Matthew at slot I would love that again I prioritize that position more than most but Tyron Matthew as your slot corner would be sick but if he's your box safety Tyler Newbin is your over the top free safety kind of replacing Marcus Williams when he departed a few years ago to go to Baltimore I think that makes a lot of sense. I like that fit a ton. It's actually one I haven't mocked up yet, so I want to explore that here at 45. Uh, Indianapolis Colts at 46. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the time. This is the pick I've most been looking forward to. Ricky Pearsall to the Indianapolis Colts, reuniting him with Anthony Richardson. One, I think Ricky Pearsall is just an upgraded version of Alec Pierce. He turns so much better, so much more sudden out of his break, so I think you're getting an upgrade as a route runner. I also think better athlete in general and with that wiggle could you get more yards after the catch stuff out of him you could I don't know if they want him to do that but I think you could if you wanted uh but I think an improved right runner uh love the hands too uh and then you have the built-in chemistry of yeah it wasn't last year right but two years ago Pearsall was easily Anthony Richardson's number one target so I love the idea of reuniting those two Richardson's arms plus arm strength, excuse me, with Ricky Pearsall's deep speed, ball skills, separation skills. Oh, I would just, this would be a match made in heaven. The question is going to be, does Pearsall make it to 46? I think there's a chance he does. I'm not super, like, I'm a big Ricky Pearsall guy, so I think he should go before this, but if he makes it to 46, I think the Colts should absolutely sprint the card. That is also dependent that they don't go receiver in round one, but Queen O. Mitchell, Ricky Pearsall. Oh, I love the draft for the Colts. Giants next up at 47. I'm going to go Ennis Rakestraw Jr. With the, the addition of Brian Burns, I was I was kind of back and forth between Max Melton keeping him in New York or Ennis Rakestraw Jr. Um, this team's got a great front seven. You bring in Brian Burns, year three of Kayvon Thibodeau. Dexter Lawrence is the best nose tackle in football, point blank and simple. Um, and I can see a world where that pass rush, that front seven generates enough heat to where you're not worried about Ennis Rakestraw and his uh, maybe, I mean, four or five one's not a major concern, but you notice it more on tape than you do for like a Taron Arnold where it's like the same 40 time, but you just don't notice it with Taron Arnold with Ennis Rakestraw. You're like, mm, yeah, that, mm, that that could end up haunting him at the NFL level. I can see where speed guys give him some fits. Uh, but I also think Deontay Banks could be like, he's the six foot two super fast sub four, four speed guy where like maybe that's his assignment. And Ennis Rakestraw gets the other guy, right? Like I could see where they just kind of split it up that way. But outside corner is absolutely a major need for the Giants right now. And Rakestraw is just a good football player. Maybe there's some limitations on this game, but you drafted Deontay Banks last year as this high upside, has all the traits kind of guy. So I think there's a world where those two kind of coexist really well with one another. Um, then we get to the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars and actually going back to the corner well. 
I was back and forth between Max Melton for uh, and Ennis Rakestraw Jr. for the Giants, and then the other one was going to become the pick for the Jaguars. Uh, I think Max Melton, with his arm length and 40 time, he showed, hey, I could be an outside corner. Would love that, and that's kind of what I'm drafting with the thought in mind. I think this team could get better in the slot, but at this point, I also want to see Antonio Johnson, a guy I liked a ton coming out of AM. Thought he'd be a great slot player. I'd like to see him man that position. So uh, you have Ronald Darby. Maybe Max Melton does play the slot. I'd be fine with that. But uh, I could also see a world where, you know, Darby's just kind of a fill in piece right now. Melton on the outside, plus Tyson Campbell. Let's give Antonio Johnson uh, the chance to earn that starting spot in the nickel. But flexibility here. That's what Max Melton gives you at pick 48. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals hate to repeat this pick, but they lost DJ Reader this year. I think they make a lot of sense. And I think 49 is about the right spot to take Devondre Sweat. Um, automatically get that run stopping production that you're kind of losing with DJ reader, but also he brings that pass rush juice. Like I think he's a really solid pass rusher uh, more so even than Jordan Davis, right? Like not only with the strength, but I think the, the move sets there. Like I think he's, he's grown over the course of the last two years in Texas uh, as a pass rusher from a move set standpoint. So I think continue to grow that and then awesome play strength and awesome uh, mover people, awesome run defender. A lot of the, it's hard to replace DJ reader. He's a great football player, but I think Devondre sweat is the best pathway for Cincinnati to do just that. Eagles are on the clock here at 50. I'm going to give them Edrin Cooper. Um, and honestly, I think this kind of works out for a couple different reasons. I think Peyton Wilson's the better linebacker right here, right now. But you got Nicobe Dean. You got Devin White there on a one-year deal. I don't think Devin White's going to look great, uh, if I'm honest. But you have him on a one-year deal. This could be the perfect situation for Edrin Cooper to basically sit for a year. And then by year two, because I think it's going to take two to three years for Cooper to really become what his potential says he could be. So you can basically draft and stash him for a year and then in another year's time, let Devin White get paid somewhere else. You get the compensatory pick potentially for that. And then it's Nicobe Dean, Edrin Cooper. Love the compliments. A lot of the weaknesses Dean had. Cooper has strengths in that area and then vice versa. So I like that a ton. It's kind of a long-term play versus like an immediate upgrade for the linebacker spot. But to me, it makes a lot of sense because of that. Uh, then we get to the Chargers after their trade down. Mike Sammer still, this team absolutely could use a playmaking slot. Mike Sammer still is 100% that. I see poor man's Devon Witherspoon. Other people see Mike Hilton. I like both those comps. <laughs> I think both of them are really good football players. Um, and just putting him in the middle. You could go outside corner here, right? And uh, we're going to come back to that pick 69. It's going to be with the Vikings. But again, like... I can see World War if the Chargers do hold on that pick. He'd be a great fit for him. Um, but they bring in Christian Fulton to play on the outside. I like that. Asante Samuel Jr. has played over 1,000 snaps outside. He kind of has this nickel corner body, but outside corner play skills. Uh, so Fulton, I, as a player, I liked a ton out of LSU. Good rookie year. Kind of been downhill since. I'm trusting Jesse Minter uh, and Jim Harbaugh to get the most out of him. Fulton plus Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside. Mike Sammer still following Harbaugh from Michigan to L.A. to play the slot. I like the uh, I like where that secondary is potentially going. And again, we'll come back and talk more about it at pick 69. Uh, Rams then at pick 52. Kind of outside of their normal drafting purview, but um, I think Peyton Wilson makes a lot of sense. Right now, linebacker's just a problem spot. Like, you got Dearness Jones, and then it's not great. So I could see them drafting and Like, this is a team that wants to win now. Like, that's why, like, Leati Latu at 19 makes a lot of sense. Peyton Wilson here at 52 for the same kind of stuff makes a lot of sense. Helps this team continue to win now. He plays a little tall, plays a little high, but 4-4-3 speed, great coverage skills, awesome tackler, uh, and wants to, you know, like fly downhill, uh, stop the run game, could be used as a blitzer too. Like, yeah, I like the fit with him and Dearness Jones a lot. And uh, again, not a normal position the Rams are drafting high, but maybe this is the year where they they, they could make it happen. Uh, then we get to the Eagles back on the clock at 53. I'm going to go Roman Wilson here. I, look, I know Paris Campbell's there now, and uh, they brought in some other... Uh, Devontae Parker, but like, look, Roman Wilson, day one he steps into the NFL field, is a better separator than Devontae Parker, and he's got more reliable hands than Paris Campbell, and also none of the injury history that comes with Paris Campbell. So I think this is just an upgrade over those other guys who could potentially be that third wide receiver. I think the Eagles made those moves, so if they don't get to draft a receiver, they have guys who can play. But I think in a perfect world, they'd like to upgrade that spot. Roman Wilson, to me, is the perfect guy to play the slot. He can also play outside if you want to move Devontae Smith inside. Like it a ton. Field stretching speed. Sharp right runner. Reliable hands. Exactly what the Eagles are looking for at a receiver three. To the Cleveland Browns, I'm going to go Chris Jenkins, another high-level run defender, plus Dalvin Tomlinson. We'll see what Siaki Ika is. They also have Daquan Jones there now. So just trying to beef up and make sure that interior defensive line is not an issue uh, moving forward. Also, they have like you know Tomlinson. There's, there's going to be a point because of how much money he's making where it's like, do we have to pay this guy this much money? Can we use that cap 
elsewhere. Uh, Daquan Jones kind of kind of the same thing. So in a lot of ways, I could kind of see where Chris Jenkins is the mainstay at that position for the next four or five years, where there may be some turnover with some other guys. But he's just he's such a high level run defender, and this team's had so many issues finding a Mike linebacker that can stay healthy and play at a high level. JOK is more of a coverage player, not a high-end run stopper, so I think Chris Jenkins keeping that linebacking core clean would be huge, and that's why I really like the fit at 54. Uh, Miami Dolphins, another week where I'm going to give him Christian Haynes. You have Graham Barton plugging at left guard. Christian Haynes is your Robert Hunt replacement. That's how we're going to keep a strength of strength, and for that offense to work, yes, Tua gets rid of the ball quickly, but interior pressure is where we saw this team get into a lot of trouble. When they were starting something called Lester Cotton at guard last year, when Liam Eikenberg, not a center, is having to play center, you have hit a problem spot. And we cannot see the Miami Dolphins get back there if they want to maximize this window with Tua before he gets you know, potential extension money. Um, and, and if Mike McDaniel wants to, and also like Tyreek Hill, like eventually there's going to come a point where it's like, his age, you're talking about it. When does a speed drop off potentially come? You know, all that sort of stuff. So, Barton at left guard, Haynes at right guard, position flexibility with both of them. Love it a ton for Miami. Dallas Cowboys at 56. This to me, he's, you know what? I'll say it. Yep, Blake Corum's still my running back one. I, I like the floor is just so high with Blake Corum. I do like the upside that Benson and Jalen Wright bring from explosive standpoints. But man, Blake Corum, just the vision, the contact balance. And also with his pro day, at the Michigan pro day, he's showcasing that he's becoming a better pass catcher. And if he does continue to build on that, it's it's then he becomes a three-down guy. So I like it a ton for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, with Pollard gone, obviously Zeke's been gone. Like Blake Corum easily become the bell cow back of that running back room. And I think him plus Deuce Vaughn as like the outside the tackle, shifty, pass catching weapon off of Blake Corum. I, I like that combo a ton. And honestly, running backs that size are kind of my preferred build because they're hard to see behind the, the offensive line. So I like that a ton. And I think that's just the move moving forward if you're Dallas. All right, to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 57. I'm going to give him Xavier Worthy. We've seen this in a couple of first round mocks now. Uh, but he's a very different receiver than Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. And also like Mike Evans, yes, he got the extension. But like going into that extension, age was something we talked about. Chris Godwin, by the time he finishes his most recent extension, age's gonna become, uh, age is going to become a question mark. Um, so I think getting a young guy in the room makes a ton of sense. And again, with the skill set that doesn't overlap with Mike Evans. Yes, Mike Evans is a field stretcher, but Worthy does, does it in a naturally different way. And he's not a slot, do everything kind of guy, fill out the middle of the field like Chris Godwin. So I like it a ton. And then last note here, his deep speed, kind of, well, it will have that Will Fuller effect where it opens up the middle of the field for, like Will Fuller did for DeAndre Hopkins. It will open up the middle of the field for Chris Godwin and also draw some attention away from Mike Evans. So I like it a ton. I'm not really in love with the idea of him going round one. If I'm honest, I like Xavier Worthy a ton. I don't hate it. But drafting him at, what, uh, 26 versus 57? To me, 57 is a lot easier of a sell. All right, Green Bay Packers back on the clock now at 58. I'm going to Javon Bullard. Could be a little box safety, slot corner uh, hybrid. They got Keyshawn Nixon back, but to me, he's more of a special team guy. Um, would love to see this team get an upgraded slot. I think Javon Bullard, you know, I, to me, it's DeGene, Arnold, but they're also like guys who could play outside corner. And then you get Javon Bullard as like an awesome slot. And actually, there's one other guy who I think actually, with his testing, we're talking about him later, he's a faller. But I think if you play him in the nickel, he might actually become a pretty solid player. Anyways, Javon Bullard, also I think this team could use an upgraded box safety, so I think he could fill that void too. He could be kind of Brian Branch, you know, strong safety, nickel corner hybrid. I just play in the slot because I prioritize it so much, but I could see the Packers using him in a little bit of that hybrid role, kind of like Chauncey Garner-Johnson. That's an, that's another comp there. Uh, Houston Texans. Uh, Texans fans, uh, I apologize. I, I didn't see a whole lot of comments talking about it, but do you guys like Jalen Polk as a fit? To me, I, I think it's, it's one that makes absolute sense. He does not have the same skills as Nico Collins or uh, Tank Dell. Very different. In a lot of ways, he's Chris Godwin. To those other two guys were field stretching Tank Dell. He really does everything, but field stretching is the first thing that kind of comes to mind, but has enough route tree you know, skills to where he can be used in the intermediate and underneath with his yak skills. Nico Collins, possession plus because he's also a deep threat. And then Polk kind of working underneath, middle of the field specifically with his hands. Um, Good route runner, can play on the outside too, so you can get kind of creative with using Nico Collins as a power slot, using Tank Dell there to create some mess matches and playing Polk outside. So I just love the flexibility he gives that receiver room. And again, I think his skill set's different than the other two guys they have on roster. All right, Bill's on the clock at 60. Let's go with Disa Isaac. This team's pass rush really dissipated over the course of the season last year. but kind of came at Oliver and the occasional Leonard Floyd play. Greg Rousseau is really good against the run, kind of still figuring out as a pass rusher. So I think getting Adisa Isaac in there, or maybe he has some run game concerns, but I think, you know, having him be in a rotation with Greg Rousseau and some of the other guys on roster, Epinesa, 
I think they'll be fine. You know, so maybe he's a DPR type of dude, but if that's the case, this team needs pass rush, and uh, they'll take it any way they can get it. So uh, a guy who can win with speed, can win with bend, can win with power, can win with arm length. Uh, I really like him as an additional pass rush juice to this Bills D line. All right, then we get to the. Uh, we're going to get to the uh, Detroit Lions. I'm going to go edge here. Braylon Trice, uh, different skill set again than Marcus Davenport and Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, and also Davenport's on a one-year deal. So I could see where Braylon Trice becomes the number two edge rusher opposite of Aiden Hutchinson moving forward. James Houston becomes that DPR. He's a little undersized. So I like him as like a third down guy. Trice size is not going to be the issue. I would just tell him, hey, the 40 was abysmal at Indy. You play so much faster at your normal weight at Washington anyways. Just go back. Just just be who you were at Washington. High motor. Never give up on a play. Bull rush the hell out of tackles. That's what we want. Aiden Hutchinson could do a lot of other things. You're the compliment to Aiden Hutchinson. So you have your skill set. Aiden does a lot of different things, and it, it kind of works out well. And then you just rotate in James Houston on a DPR situation. So I like it a lot there for Detroit. Back to the Baltimore Ravens. I'm going to go Jonah Ellis here. I think this team could use one more edge rusher. Of Jabo's 265 pounds, always in that 260 range. So I think they can afford to go in the 240, 245 window. That Jonah Ellis, I think he's technically, yeah, 246. I think Utah, he's probably closer to like 238, 240. Um, but I think they can make do with that because they have some other guys that carry a little bit more weight. This team will also probably sign someone late in free agency to be like a early downs guy. Uh, so Jonah Ellis is like a DPR, another team that if you give him one more pass rusher, it gets really, really frightening to face that Ravens defense. So he's a specialized guy, but I think Jonah Ellis could absolutely thrive in Baltimore. All right, pick 63 is going to be Ruko Rororo heading to San Francisco. This is a team that just moved on from Eric Armstead, as we noted earlier, inside-out flexibility. It's a team that... Uh, had uh, Charles Menehu kind of doing the same stuff. Now they have neither one of those guys there. So I think Ruka Rororo could be a kind of a power edge, run-stopping guy on early downs out wide, kick him inside, use him as a pass rusher on uh, passing downs. Him and Javon Hargrave, I think that's a really fun, uh, you know, third and long kind of pass rush from the interior. So like the fit a ton, and he just kind of matches up with other guys with similar skill sets that they've already drafted and added to the roster. And then it picks 64, an easy one here for me. The Kansas City Chiefs are going to draft Patrick Paul. I don't love the athletic you know, profile of Patrick Paul, but look, he's got a ton of true pass sets under his belt, and he's got pterodactyl wings for arms. Like He's kind of the perfect guy for Kansas City, where you're not really worried about the athletic upside. You just need someone to keep Patrick Mahomes' blindside clean. I think Patrick Paul can do just that. All right, now let's jump into the third round. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. We start with a, a trade here. I did want to give uh, the Denver Broncos a quarterback, so it's going to be 76 plus 147 for pick 65 off of the trade. Denver's going to select Michael Penix. As much as I think Bo Nix could be Sean Payton's guy, Michael Penix could be, you know, stand and, you know, he's not very mobile, but like he could just be that pocket passer, you know, trigger man for Sean Payton. In a lot of ways, that could also make a lot of sense. And also, you get him here in the third round, it basically becomes a competition between him and Jared Sidham for week one. Could make some sense. I do think Bo Nix at 12 is more likely to be Sean Payton's dude, but I'd be kind of intrigued by Michael Penix and Sean Payton offense. All right, pick 66. We haven't gone uh, offensive line just yet for the Arizona Cardinals. I think in a perfect world, Jonah Williams should be at playing uh, should be playing left guard. Let's have Blake Fisher. A lot of upside there, just never really had it fully mined at Notre Dame. Maybe the Arizona Cardinals can crack the code and he can become their starting right tackle. And again, Williams, I think, is better at guard. 67, I'm going to give the Washington Commanders an absolute dream selection here. If JT Sanders makes it to this pick, I think they're sprinting the card in. It's Zach Ertz, and then they need someone for the future. JT Sanders is exactly that. So we get to pick 68 here with the New England Patriots. I'm actually going to have them make a trade back with the Las Vegas Raiders. Part of this is just to comply with my tackle ratings. I think uh, when I have New England tank, Dominic Puna should basically come off the board before that. But it's going to be pick 77 plus uh, 148 with the Raiders coming up. And real quick, earlier I made note that we were going to double down on offensive line for the Raiders. I decided I'm going to go ahead and change my mind here. Um, and I'm making a little bit of a pivot on the fly here. But at pick number 68, I'm actually going to give the Raiders Elijah Jones. Six foot two, uh, you know, almost 200 pounds uh, and a ton of athleticism. The more I watch Elijah Jones, the more I'm like, yeah, this dude's got a really nice shot to be a really solid NFL player. And right now, the, the cornerback room right now for the Raiders feel like they're kind of lacking size. You got Jack Jones, who's got a solid build, but, you know, Ja'Korian Bennett, you know, more speed than I would say, like a kind of a physical build. So, I don't know. Bennett could still take a, a, a year or two step forward for sure. But, uh, and also, like, Jack Jones has plenty of issues on his, you know, in his own space, you know. So, I think Elijah Jones is both a contingency for one of those two players not working out or could just be an upgrade if Bennett doesn't take that step forward. Then we get to the Vikings, and again, 
This could have been the Charger selection. Uh, I used the trade chart, used uh, the Draft Tech uh, trade chart. 5 and 69 was still less points than 11 and 23, but I could see a world where the Vikings, hey, they gave up. They're moving up for a quarterback. They're not going to get a pick back. Totally understand that. But nonetheless, either way you spin it, I think the Chargers or the Vikings could use a player like Cam Hart. Both teams could use another big body corner. The Chargers did sign Christian Fulton, but that's a one-year deal, so nothing like saying that that's a long-term piece. So it could be Fulton versus Cam Hart if the Chargers went in this direction. But for Minnesota, I think Josh Metellus, like, not to say he's Javon Holland, but a lot of the ways that Brian Flores used Javon Holland when he first got there, Josh Patel has kind of used that role last year uh, in the Brian Flores defense. You got Cameron Bynum playing over the top free safety, Harrison uh, Smith back for another year. Corner's a spot I'm focused on. And I think Byron Murphy can play outside. Cam Hart is an upgrade over Caleb Evans. Patel is in the slot. I'm feeling better about that secondary for Brian Flores. Here at pick 70, I think the Giants could still use uh, another interior offensive lineman. I figure Evan Neal is going to take one of those two guard spots. Yeah, they signed John Runyon, but look, like John Runyon should not have been getting $10 million a year. Like, it's just that point blank and simple. Uh, Pooney does come with some uh, center flexibility as well. So you could play him at center if um, it doesn't work out with John Michael Schmitz. But um, look, I understand John Ryan, uh, or uh, yeah, John Runyon, excuse me. He's getting all that money. But I, I just think you bring in Pooney, and if Runyon doesn't work out, you have him already in room. Um, and I, now I don't know. Like Evan Neal, I guess, is going to play left guard. That's where I'd play Dominic Pooney, though. So I'd, I'd play Neal at right guard in this case. Pooney at left guard. Giants fans, let me know what you think about that John Runyon signing. I just wasn't super high on it. And uh, I had to double-check the guarantees. But if they're not too high, wouldn't be shocked if he's not a New York Giant going into the next season. But again, I had to double-check the guarantees there. I think Dominic Pooney could just be better. And also, that's the thing. Like You could have John Runyon start for two years, Dominic Pooney not. And then by year three of his rookie contract, he does become a starter. So it doesn't have to be right away for Dominic Pooney with the New York Giants. All right, pick 71. I'm going to give the Arizona Cardinals Junior Colson. I think they could use a nice long-term piece at linebacker. Colson, not super gifted from an athletic standpoint, but just gets the position. A little bit new to learn the game, but man, he's picked it up quick. Three years of starting experience for Jim Harbaugh, including being starting as a true freshman. That's insane. So I just like his instincts. I like the skill that he brings to the table. I think the Cardinals could get better there. At pick 72, I'm going to give the New York Jets uh, Quan McMillan or Jalen McMillan. Uh, I've always been a big McMillan guy. Love what he brings after the catch. Uh, also has solid size. Like I know he kind of gets labeled as this inside slot guy. Nice yards after the catch skills. But 6'1", 192. Kind of has a build that could maybe be viable on the outside. They kind of sprinkle that in. Love the long speed. Could be a slot fade demon for Aaron Rodgers and Nathaniel Hackett offense too. Uh, but I also think he just has the yak skill that the Jets don't have right now. So that's kind of the skill set I was thinking about with that selection. Detroit Lions, one of my favorite picks here. Zach Zinter. I feel like he's really been forgotten about this process just because he had that late injury but you know hey the team just signed Kevin Zeitler to play right guard I think that's perfect you, you have Kevin Zeitler start at right guard for this year you let Zach Zenter continue to rehab and recover from the injury and then he's your right guard beyond this year so I like that a ton uh pick number 74 for the Atlanta Falcons I'm gonna go Jaden Hicks here it just ultimately has not worked out with Richie Grant I think Jaden Hicks gives you a lot of those same skill sets but better um yeah, so I just think it's an upgrade there at that safety spot. And you have Jesse Bates playing over the top. Free safety, so a lot of box work for Jaden Hicks. I think that's probably the best place for him. Uh, Chicago Bears, we went yeah, we went into your offensive line, or into your defensive line, excuse me, uh, with that first pick. So edge was something that still needed to be explored. Marshawn Nealand, perfect body type into the fit into that 4-3 defense. Love the speed to power. And also, I think he comes with a good amount of bend that can be built upon. So needs to be polished with some time. So maybe he's not starting right away. But by year two or year three, if they can coach him up from a pass rush standpoint, I think there's a special skill set to uh, be mined out of Marshawn Nealand. All right, pick 76 after the trade back. I'm going to give the Carolina Panthers Cedric Van Pran. He actually had a really nice three cone, solid short shuttle too. Like So I think the movement skills are actually decent for Cedric Van Pran. So uh, right now it's Austin Corbett playing center, but I think Van Pran could basically take that job from him day one. Uh, and I think he's a better mover than people are giving him credit for. He's just not like special. He's not a lead. He's not Tyler Linderbaum. He's not Jax Powers Johnson, but that doesn't mean that he's an abysmal mover all the same. All right, now the uh, New York, uh, excuse me, New England Patriots after their move down. I'm going to move him, uh, Matt Goncalves. Uh, got hurt this year at Pittsburgh, but guard, uh, or excuse me, tackle flexibility at both spots, um, and this could have been the year where he breaks himself into that second-round conversation with a good year, but he got hurt, so I think New England would be a good play for him to go, get developed, and uh, let's see what this upside brings for Goncalves. Uh, and also, like, 6'6", 321, kind of that big body tackle. I think the, the play string is kind of an interesting one. Uh, wish we had a, 
I, I wish I could have more tape to look at, more recent tape to look at to see where that stands. But if he can add a little bit of power, I could see him starting pretty soon for New England at left tackle. All right, Washington Commanders then at 78. I'm going to give him Gabriel Murphy. We didn't get to go edge earlier, so uh, just giving him a guy with a ton of college production, Great PFF pass rush grades, a great pass rush win rate as well. So love Gabriel Murphy, kind of a just solid. Let's get this guy in the room. He'll be a, he'll be a competent starter for us day one. Maybe he doesn't have the upside of some of the other guys, but hey, right now we're just looking for solid starters. I think Gabe Murphy could at least be that. All right, Atlanta Falcons then at 79. I'm gonna go Michael Hall Jr. Look, I mean, I'm not saying he's Grady Jarrett, but kind of has those Grady Jarrett isms, kind of smaller. The arm length isn't insane. Uh, Grady Jarrett's getting up there in age, uh, so I wonder if they could bring Michael Hall uh, Jr. along as like. A DPR, third down, pass rush specialist, right? Just using them on those uh, passing downs. But over the course of the next two, three, maybe four years, uh, whenever Grady Jarrett has moved on from, maybe Michael Hall Jr. could step into that spot. That'd be a really fun one. But yeah, defensive heavy here for this three-round mock for the uh, Falcons. But I love all the moves, really patting up and uh, just cleaning up that side of the ball. Uh, then we get to the Cincinnati Bengals once more at pick number eight. Uh, yeah, we went uh, offensive line in the first round, but I don't really think they should stop there. Left guard has been a problem spot. Cordell Volson is just not a good football player. Cooper BB is an average to maybe slightly above average athlete, but with awesome play strength, a ton of pass production work under his belt. Let's keep the pocket clean for Joe Burrow. Love the pass pro skill set that BB brings to the table. Cincinnati, uh, excuse me, geez, I'm all over the place. Seattle Seahawks uh, on the clock now at 81. Uh, they lose both their starting sen- uh, safeties from last year. Let's go Cam Kitchens here. The 4 6 40, and then he runs the same thing as Pro Day. That's a little concerning, but I think the on field instincts kind of make up for that. And man, he, his range on tape looks fantastic. So the 40 time doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but whether it's in the box or over the top, I think there's a role to be had there in Seattle. I think a perfect world. Kitchens plays over the top, kind of like that Marcus Williams role. And then Julian Love's kind of the box safety, kind of hybrid, moving all over the place, kind of like Kyle Hamilton was last year in Baltimore for new head coach Mike McDonald. All right, Indianapolis Colts are next up at pick 82. I don't necessarily know if Austin Booker fully hits their, like, kind of MO for an edge rusher because he's not, like, the, the athletic testing, honestly, was a little disappointing. But really interesting body type and, you know, six foot six and the long arms. I think there's something to be mined there, and he plays faster on the field. So um, just kind of draft, stash, and develop type of dude. Um, and edge continues to be an issue spot for the Colts. So I just think you just keep throwing darts at the board and see if eventually one of them pays off for you. Let me get to the Los Angeles Rams once more. This is where I'm going to have Kamari Laster come off the board. And look, awesome 40 times. Sub Devils 3 cone. It's just like it is pro day. And keep in mind, pro day 40 times are typically better. We're getting 40 times from 4.6 to 4.65. That's rough. Like, that's that's brutal. But let me also say, this Los Angeles Rams team is the same one who drafted Darion Kendrick on day three who ran like a 4-7 and isn't as big as Corey Laster and wasn't trusted to start as a true freshman for Kirby Smart. So I think Laster's a much better, more naturally skilled corner than Darion Kendrick. He's slightly faster, but also that three cone. Like, I know Quentin Lake played the slot and it ended up becoming a pretty solid slot corner. Maybe they give the chance to Laster to play on the outside, but I could also see a world where Laster could become a really nice slot player. Like, that change of direction skills to me signals that, like, he can have that lateral change of direction, that lateral movement that I want on the inside. And with 4-6 speed, I don't really want him on the outside going against, you know, guys like Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and other speedsters, right? So, I don't know. Nickel might end up being the move uh, for Kamari Laster. I might have to shift him over in my position rankings when uh, whenever I decide to publish those. So, uh, let's move on to the Pittsburgh Steelers then. Uh, pick 84, and I mean... Pittsburgh Steelers on day two drafting a wide receiver with potential off-field disgruntlement and uh, off-field concerns. Never heard this story before. Now, he really does kind of feel like a Pittsburgh Steelers from that standpoint. Um, also, think he's kind of that field stretcher, super explosive guy deep down the field that they're now losing with Deontay Johnson. Johnson did more than that. He's also a great yards after the catch underneath guy, underrated underneath separator. Don't know if Burton's necessarily bringing that, but... You know, probably a hard slant off of what he could do vertically is enough. But him plus George Pickens, Van Jefferson, still not a sexy wide receiver room. But Burton as wide receiver two gives me a lot more hope than Van Jefferson at wide receiver two. So we'll see what Pittsburgh's plans are at wide receiver. Maybe it happens earlier than this. Um, Burton definitely comes with some off-field concerns, some character concerns. But look, if we're just talking talents, like I don't think PFF's got it wrong. Like he's ahead of guys like Keon Coleman. Like, I think talent wise, Keon Coleman's super talented. Jermaine Burton's uber talented. He's got a lot of other stuff kind of working against him right now. Anyways, let's move on to the uh, Cleveland Browns. Let's go off the tackle here in Christian Jones. Cedric Wills just hasn't lived up to the first round pick. He's coming off injury. Christian Jones, Cedric Wills, I think you make it a camp battle at left tackle next year for Cleveland. 
Houston Texans next up. I'm going to go Roger Rosegarden. I think right tackle is a spot where they can continue to get better. Roger Rosegarden, let's just, maybe he's, you know, sitting behind Titus, uh, Titus Howard for a little bit, or maybe he earns that starting spot sooner rather than later. I just like the flexibility he gives you. I could also see a world where Kenyon Green doesn't really fit with that zone blocking scheme if they want to stick with that. Um, in Houston, so Howard might move inside. Uh, maybe you move Garden inside, Rose Garden inside. I could also see that. So um, just some flexibility. One more guy in that offensive line that could be a solid starter if push comes to shove. It also might give you the flexibility to move some pieces around that better fit that blocking scheme. All right, Dallas on the clock here at pick number 87. I'm going to go Christian Mahogany. I think this team could use one more uh, offensive lineman, and we didn't go tackle in round one. So Let's just draft Christian Mahogany. I think he's a better mover than people are giving him credit for. Play him at left guard. Tyler Smith is your left tackle of the future in Dallas. like that a good bit. They could also still be players in like uh, free agency for a uh, another guard. So that's also on table. And maybe Mahogany just becomes this versatile, move him around type of dude. I'd also love to give them a center. So you could look at that here at 87 instead. All right, Green Bay Packers are next up at 88. Same pick as last time. I'm going to go with Trey Benson. Really like his, um, him as a compliment. For, sub 4-4 four, four speed, great pass catching ability. I like him a ton as a compliment to Josh Jacobs. And we already saw where Matt LaFleur wants to have a little bit of a committee. He, he can have a top guy, but he wants that number two player to be uh, involved pretty heavily too. And I think Benson plus Josh Jacobs, that's an awesome running back committee, in my opinion. Stick at the running back spot. Rashad White, I don't think he's a great, like, I don't think he has great vision running the ball. And I think between the tackles, not awesome, but um, good athlete, can run wide, and is an awesome pass catcher. They really tapped into his pass catching skill sets when they really just kind of turned the offense over to Baker Mayfield, second half of last year. And I think Jonathan Brooks could be that early down guy that they were looking for. Better vision, more explos- uh, more explosiveness when, in regards to running through the tackle, just hitting the hole, hitting it hard, getting five yards at least, you know. Plus the, the strength that he has, too. I think that's a nice compliment to Rashad White's game, too. So I think Brooks' strength perfectly overlap with where Rashad White weaknesses are and vice versa. Uh, so I like this a ton. I'm not worried about the ACL injury. Really like the value, too, at 89. This is where I started to, like, I kind of dig where the running backs are coming off the board. Speaking of running backs coming off the board, I think this is now three straight mocks. Sorry, Cardinals fans, but you guys also have had, let's just see. Um, uh, I can't, I can't. Actually, let's just take a quick look. Let's take a, a small detour here. How many picks have the Arizona Cardinals already had? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. That, that was the sixth pick you guys have made me make in this mock. I'm stretched thin here. Jalen Wright, Perfect compliment to James Conner. One is the explosive guy. One is like kind of the the Jonathan Brooks, uh, kind of that you know, or that Blake Quorum type, where he's just like between the tackles, rock solid, can play with a lot of strength, fight through contact. That's James Conner. Writes the perfect explosive compliment to that. Also a little bit more receiving upside, and also I just want to see a backfield with Jalen Wright's explosiveness and Kyler Murray. That sounds like a problem to stop for an opposing defense. Back to the Green Bay Packers, another team that's made me draft a lot in this mock draft. Uh, but uh, I think Jeremiah Trotter Jr. makes a lot of sense here. Get that coverage skill set. It's a compliment to Quay Walker. You lose Devondre Campbell. I think linebacker is something you're eventually going to draft. The arms are a little small. He himself is a little bit on the smaller side, but I like the coverage uh, feel that he has. And I think that's a good fit for a uh, guy next to Quay Walker. Once again, back to the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm going to give them a starter and an upgrade over uh, Matt Filer from last year at left guard. Mason McCormick, love the movement skills. Yes, he's coming from a smaller school. Just does kind of give shades of Cody Mock 2.0, but uh, I think Mock could take a step forward in year two. And I think Mason McCormick, especially in that if it stays kind of a zone blocking scheme, a perfect fit there at left guard. And then you're still figuring out center. Maybe it's Robert Hainsey. Hopefully he gets better uh, in year three, but um, I, I just love focusing on Matt Filer to Mason McCormick. I think that's a big upgrade there, specifically from the run game standpoint for this Tampa Bay team. All right, let me get to the Ravens at pick number 93. One of my one of my guys in this class, Javon Baker. I know he's a, a lot of people's sleeper wide receiver. I like him a ton. Uh, I know the athletic testing wasn't insane, but it's the release packages. It's the contested catch skills, the size, the play strength. I like a lot of that. Also, the red zone drills at the Senior Bowl give me a lot of hope for him to be a big factor in the offense there. And he's just a different different type of receiver than Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman. He has more size, he has more strength, and has more contested catch ability than those guys. So I think he could be that man coverage, contested catch guy, uh, and then those other guys kind of fill in elsewhere and beat other coverages and things like that. So I think this just rounds out that receiver room. Then we get to the 49ers, and this is where I'm going to have DJ James come off the board. Not that corner's like necessarily the biggest need. I mean, I know it's technically a need here on PFF, but you know, like I think Lenore's fine. I think Ambry Thomas is okay. Uh, but it doesn't, hate, it doesn't hurt to get one more guy in there, and I think DJ James at 94, really nice athlete with a good frame, still needs to add some weight, so maybe you, you keep him on the bench for a year, and then by year two, maybe you get him up to like that 180, 185 mark would be ideal. 
and he'll still have plenty of speed. Uh, I'm not worried about that dissipating or anything like that. Uh, but love the man coverage skills he puts on tape at Auburn. Had a lot of the hard assignments, you know, week in and week out, getting teams number one wide receiver. So uh, I think he'd be a really nice player and a better pro in a lot of ways uh, the next level than he was at college. And he was he was a good underrated college corner. He really was. Uh, but because Auburn wasn't great, he doesn't get a whole lot of uh, love and attention. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs are next up at 95. Uh, one of two guys have your pick here if you're a Chiefs fan. I'm going to go Leonard Taylor. But I also totally get Mason Smith. Both guys have huge upsides. Mason Smith, former number one recruit. He's played some edge, moved inside, you know, uh, and last year wasn't awesome, but it wasn't a terrible year. Leonard Taylor to me is just a little more interesting. Um, Smith has the recruiting profile, but man, I just look at Taylor and it's like, dude, NFL, like top end NFL size and athleticism combination. It's just he doesn't have a pass rush skill set. Like he doesn't know what he's doing there. He's just winning with size and athleticism. Putting him next to Chris Jones is one hell of a mentor to have, right? Like, if there's someone who can coach him up and fix that, Chris Jones is the guy. So, I like that a ton. I could also see where Mason Smith, another feather in his cap, probably a better day one run defender than Leonard Taylor. So, maybe you do go in that direction just to replace Derek Nottie, who's not very good. So, Leonard Taylor, Mason Smith, I like them both here at 95 for Kansas City. To the Jags one more time. I'm going to go Brandon Dorless. I think this team could use one more interior defensive lineman. I think Dorless is a good player. Can play some edge. Can play some inside. And that's kind of the flexibility I'm looking for. This team did just draft Eric Armstead. I totally get that. But I think having one other guy in the fold like that is not a bad piece to have. Especially in the event of injury or what have you. Um, and I would I would assume Armstead's going to play some early down edge with Josh Allen. And then eventually he'll move inside on passing downs to get Trayvon Walker in the field. And I think you could basically do the same thing with Brandon Dorless. You know, just as some depth. Also, interior defensive line. You know, Roy Robertson Harris eventually going to have his contract come up. I can see Doris being a eventual replacement for that. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals at 97. I'm going to go with Theo Johnson. We're having a nice little tight end run here. I'm a big fan of the upside that Theo Johnson has. I mean, he's probably best suited in a vertical based offense. Like, if I do something different down the line where the Jets get a receiver at 10, I could see at 72 where he's that vertical run the seams tight end that Aaron Rodgers likes. Um, the steering, you know, there's probably a reason he didn't run the three cone, right? Like the steering is a little questionable, but I think he does everything else at a high level. And with how good of an athlete he is, I think there's room for him to improve his route running and his sharpness, breaking left and right. I think we can improve that lateral movement skills with some time. And, uh, you know, I think Mike Kosicki can kind of be the immediate starter. You use Theo Johnson as a blocker year one, and then hopefully you get him coached up, get that improved steering mobility, uh, and then eventually becomes that full-time starter year two. Uh, to the Los Angeles Chargers, the big reason why I just don't give this team Brock Bowers is they have so many other holes, and I think they could just go draft someone like Eric All here uh, at pick 98. ACL injury, yes. Back injury, yes. But they're not correlated, and I think he's moved past that. Had a clean... Uh, bill of health this last year at iowa really productive super explosive athlete uh good route runner i think he has this combination of athleticism plus nuance and, and understanding of how to be a good route runner both with like the routes themselves but setting up defenders what he shows head fakes shoulder fakes things like that um and also a, a monster yards after the catch guy like i'm not saying sam laporta sam laporta just broke every you know rookie season tight end record there was but eric all has a lot of the same stuff to like about Sam Laporta. And yes, he does come from the same school, but he's also Michigan transfer. So like, if you like that, like he got highly recruited by one of the best recruiting programs in the country in Michigan, decides to go to Iowa, has a really nice season this last year. He stayed healthy. I, I think, I think he'll be a really, I think he'll be a better pro. I think he'd be a really solid tight end and, and a pretty bad tight end class. Like I, hard to imagine him not being my tight end three, the more I watch and the more I like out of Eric Hall. And he's kind of the tight end that Harbaugh is looking for. It has the size too, right? Like you don't have to worry about, Oh, Bowers two thirty five. Is he really the Harbaugh guy? You know? So I think ultimately this would be the tight end route that the Chargers are looking to explore. Two more picks to go. Spencer Rattler is going to go to the Los Angeles Rams. If there's a guy to get the most out of Spencer Rattler at the next level, Sean McVay is one of the first guys that comes to mind. Uh, and I think Jimmy Garoppolo, yeah, he's there as a backup, but I think they're going to trade him at the deadline or buy the deadline for picks. They'll get a fourth rounder for him. So I think they're spending money to get a draft pick. That uh, that That's the move there. So I think Rattler is ultimately going to be the backup behind Stafford. And the last pick here, thought about Cade Stover. I think he's totally a tight end. That could be uh, a good option for the commanders. But we went JT Sanders earlier on, so made the decision easy here. Just generally, if they don't go JT Sanders, though, like Cade Stover, keep an eye on him right here at a 100. But I'm going to go Johnny Wilson. This team just doesn't have a big body physical wide receiver yet on the roster. Uh, and I really like the idea of uh, Johnny Wilson kind of being that compliment to Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson, who are both great route runners. I think Dotson's got really solid hands. Terry McLaurin's become a really nice contested catch, physical deep threat guy, uh, more so than he ever showed at college, specifically on the contested catch side. But at the same time, they're still missing that big body physical guy. And I think Johnny Wilson can totally be that. And also, pick 100, like I, I think he should go before that. So I think you're getting a really, really good value. But guys, I'm scrolling through to show you each and every pick one more time. And let me hear it down below in the comments section. 
Jackson. Who's your favorite team? Did you love the picks I gave your team? Did you hate them? Are you somewhere there in between? I'd love to hear it down below. Just as long as you're respectful, I try to respond to every comment as I possibly can. So just be cordial, be respectful with me, and just like let me let me hear it. I, I'd love to know your take on it. Do you like your team? If you're a Dolphins fan, do you not want to double up an offensive line? Tell me why. Tell me what other spots you think you could draft. Whatever your team is, let me know the position groups you're looking at and what prospects you think fit the best with your squad. I'd love to hear it down below in the comments section. But hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hit that like button if you did. If you're new around here, be sure hit that big red subscribe button and join our community with plenty more mock drafts and draft content in general on the horizon. But that's going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I am signing off. <laughs>